Now, UKIP have been launching their economic policy up in the northwest today with a speech from Nigel Farage. In a moment, we'll be talking to the party's economic spokesman, Patrick O'Flynn. But first, let's have a listen to some of what Nigel Farage had to say. What Patrick is going to do today is to outline a plan to give ordinary people a better chance in life and to set out, as far as government spending is concerned, a reallocation of our spending priorities from the European Union and foreign aid and a number of vanity projects to increasing spending on defence so that we actually can be a credible international country and we're the only party that can find extra money for our hard-pressed National Health Service without increasing borrowing. Nigel Farage there. Well, Patrick O'Flynn joins us now from Middleton. Welcome to The Daily Politics. Patrick O'Flynn, a rise of defence spending of £3 billion a year. How will you fund it? Uh, well, as I've made clear today, uh, we're prepared to stipulate we are making very big spending cuts, bringing the foreign aid budget down from... Uh, 11 billion pounds to 2 billion for instance uh, leaving the EU so ending net contributions uh, of up to 10 billion pounds scrapping the HS2 vanity project uh, which will average about 3 billion pounds a year of capital spending uh, in the next parliament and also equalizing the per capita spending uh, in Scotland uh, to the level that pertains in England so so those are our, our main big ticket spending savings we'll be announcing um, some further uh, pruning uh, of Whitehall uh, as well closer to our manifesto but we have a very large sum of money available uh, to fund our key public spending priorities which are the NHS uh, and rebuilding our defences uh, and indeed to uh, give our key tax cuts including taking people on the minimum wage out of income tax. But are, I mean, aren't you just threatening to send good money after bad, especially since your party is also so sceptical about getting involved with foreign wars? Why would you need such a big military or defence build-up? Well, I think it's because uh, we're, we're rather in the opposite camp to, to the established parties here. Uh, in that I, I can never remember if it was Roosevelt or Churchill who said the best way to conduct yourself on the international stage was to speak softly but carry a big stick. In the case of uh, Cameron and Miliband and Clegg, it's shout your mouth off while carrying a matchstick. So, yes, we would uh, limit... Uh, the circumstances in which we expect our forces to go in harm's way and yet we would invest in those forces uh, and we think that is a policy that would be supported by the vast majority of British people who think our forces have been overextended uh, and under equipped uh, in, in the first part of the 21st century. But I mean Nigel Farage says your tax policy will help struggling Britons. How does scrapping inheritance tax help those who are struggling? Bearing in mind we're talking about 3% of the population. Well, look, our key flagship policy is to lift the personal allowance to at least £13,000 during the next Parliament. Sure, but uh, we on also inheritance are the people tax. We've actually put on the map the people... Yeah, on inheritance tax, uh, the, the people I speak to from all kinds of backgrounds, including uh, working-class backgrounds who've worked all their life to buy their house out of taxed income, they want this tax gone out of principle. They're not bothered about, you know, uh, you know little, little sort of decile benefits here and there to, to the better off. They feel as a matter of principle that it is wrong to tax people on assets they bought out of their tax income and the fruits of their labours. And I'm willing to have that uh, debate with any of the other political parties because I know many people spend their 60s and their 70s fretting and worrying about passing on their wealth and what's going to happen. All right, well, and I want to take that away from them. So UKIP, in principle, says get rid of inheritance tax altogether. Well, let's have a look uh, and talk about some of your candidates because you seem to be having some problems with um, some of your personnel. Your prospective candidate for Folkestone and Hyde, the MEP Janice Atkinson, is facing a disciplinary hearing today. I, I think, Are you I able we're, to we're tell far us... far from alone. No, we're far uh, from sure, alone, aren't let me, we? Let me, let me just finish the question. I mean, are you able to tell us if she'll still be your candidate by the end of the day, Patrick? I'm not able to say because I'm not involved at all in that disciplinary process. Right. I mean, we've heard from senior UKIP source. They'd be very surprised if Janice Atkinson walked out of disciplinary hearing today and back into the election campaign as candidate. Do you agree with that after what you've heard about what she is alleged to have done? 
Well, look, uh, what I agree with is that UKIP will run a proper and rigorous disciplinary process uh, that will benefit from not being prejudiced by careless comments aside from senior members of the party. Right. Uh, on a more general level, uh, Nigel Farage has made clear, and I made clear actually in my speech at Margate, that we expect the highest standards from people at senior reaches in our party who form the collective leadership of our party. Right, but you, why do you think UKIP then has a particular problem with keeping candidates? Because since 2010, the party has suspended at least 19 councillors, 14 parliamentary candidates, a national secretary, its youth leader, one spokesperson, its Scotland chair, an entire local branch, three MEPs and a local committee. And that's in the last 18 months. I'll tell you what, give the um, uh, researcher an extra biscuit who, who did that. Oh, they'll get more than an extra biscuit. Did they do biscuit? a similar one about the Labour Party? The Conservative... The, did, did they do a similar list for the Labour Party, the Conservative Party uh, and the Liberal Democrats? What you might call a controlled experiment to see if there is a discernible UKIP factor here or are you just listing, uh, you know, for a party of more than 42,000 members... I'll tell you, you why. Know, ..an admittedly too long list of mistakes. Right, OK. Well, you haven't actually answered the, the, the question, but I'll tell you why. Because you said, and Nigel Farage has often said, that UKIP would be different. We won't be like the established parties that you have just there uh, said have the similar problems. But you're not different, are you? You have exactly the same problems. Uh, well, I think we're different in the sense that, that when the problems arise and come to light, we deal with them quickly. And as Nigel said, uh, in an interview, I don't know if it's yesterday or today, pretty ruthlessly. Uh, we take a very strong uh, stance where any wrongdoing or bigotry is exposed. Right. So I would say we, we seek to be different in that regard. OK, but I will give the researcher the extra biscuit. Now, well, stay there, Patrick, for the moment, because we want to get your reaction to this protest which caught Nigel Farage by surprise yesterday. Demonstrators from the group Stand Up to UKIP arrived at a pub in Kent where the UKIP leader was having Sunday lunch with his wife and two children aged 10 and 15. Mr Farage said the protesters scared his children who ran away to hide and described the group who mounted the stunt as scum. Well, the organiser of that protest, Dan Glass, joins us now. Uh, Dan, so you've been described as scum by Nigel Farage. What do you say to that? Um, uh, well, being described by Nigel Farage as scum is highly um, surprising considering his baseline of intelligence. You know, to put it into context, I wouldn't really call it a, a protest. It was more a celebration of diversity. We were in his local pub in Kent. Um, all the groups who were targeted by Nigel Farage and the rest of UKIP's continuous foul prejudice. So people, and it was songs and dances and family, family friendly fun. So you had people living with HIV doing an HIV anti-stigma class. You had Mexican migrants who had a piñata which said bigotry on which everyone smashed together. You had breastfeeding mothers. We had a speech by a Holocaust survivor looking at what it means in terms of the rise of the right-wing mentality and, and prejudice which comes out of UKIP on this poignant 70th anniversary. And we ended up the cabaret doing a conga line singing We Are Family um, and which snaked across the road when we heard that he was in the pub across the road. And it's really important to say that our target was obviously never Nigel Farage's family. Right. And of course, we respect the fact that he was having a Sunday lunch. Everyone needs a day off. Mm. But people who are affected by his prejudice can't get right. a day off from the wounding. From right, you, say, you said that you weren't targeting his family deliberately, but not. his children were frightened, they were scared. You were, we've got the pictures of the, your group uh, supporters surrounding the car. It does look intimidating. I didn't see his children in the car. In fact, it was him and another lady, maybe his wife. Um, and it, again, I say, we, didn't, uh, we meant no disrespect to his family, but I do understand why people are really angry that every day they read the papers and there's more prejudice and ignorant co uh, comments and very much the blame culture which Nigel Farage exists upon. He thinks he can go about his daily life saying these people are the problem, those people are the problem, those people are the problem. But when we come to his community in all our glorious diversity saying, hmm, I wonder what a life beyond UKIP would look like, He's the one who runs away with his tail between his legs. So okay. He calls us sad and lonely. We were the ones having fun and he was right. on his own. Patrick, what do you say in response to that? Family-friendly event sounds quite bohemian but not threatening. Well, I don't think that's what independent eyewitnesses have reported. Um, I really uh, find Mr Glass and his organisation and his comments pretty reprehensible uh, and sickening and don't particularly want to, uh, to kind of add to 
whatever platform you're, you're granting him on the back of that behaviour. But, you know, we are a democracy. Uh, UKIP got more than 4 million votes last year. UKIP is making important arguments and putting new choices on the ballot paper. But shouldn't Dan's uh, group be allowed Glass to protest? such a groundswell of support... No, if Mr Glass has got such a groundswell of support from so many uh, different areas, then he should either stand for election or support one of the many parties that opposes the things UKIP believes in. Right. Of course, peaceful protest is legitimate, but not picking out people who are with their families trying to enjoy a quiet family lunch. That really, I don't think, is legitimate at all. Was it fair of Nigel Farage to call them scum? Well, I think uh, it, it, anyone who'd been with their family who uh, had the occasion overrun like that uh, is entitled to call it as they see it. Right. I mean, Dan Goss, how would you feel if there had been a similar group outside your house or a group of UKIP protesters outside your house when your family were there? How would I feel? OK, just to unpack um, when our friend says sickening, um, uh, and thank you for your kind offer for standing for election, but I'm a community worker and I work with communities who are affected by inequality on the ground, of which there are many uh, because of the obscene prejudice and inequality which UKIP thrive upon. So I'm not going to stand for election, but thank you for the offer. Um, of course I wouldn't want anyone's family, including my own, to be targeted. What's sickening is the continued bile which comes out of of UKIP's mouth, you know, saying stuff like people with HIV shouldn't be allowed in the country, breastfeeding mothers should face the war. The continuous Islamophobia coming out of their mouths is sickening right. in this day and age in 2015. That is sickening. Le and it's really important to say I've, I'm quite tired today because I've been up half the night with death threats. I'm not saying they're from UKIP, I haven't established who they're from. I'm currently in touch with the police. All right. But that is unacceptable as well. What? And if that's the party that you want to promote, then you go ahead. Right, and you said, uh, Patrick O'Flynn, that obviously peaceful protest is legitimate and should be allowed. What do you say to Dan Glass's comments about what he calls the sickening remarks by UKIP members about things like Islamophobia, about people with HIV? That's his perception. What do you say to that? Uh, well, I say he's wrong about that, and I say it's really quite preposterous that he seems not only to be donning the cloak of moral superiority uh, that many on the ideological uh, left do, but he also seems to be trying to portray himself uh, as the victim of, of this set of events that, that he and his organisation set in train. You know, uh, as I said to him earlier on, on another debate that I was drawn into with him, uh, I don't find him a, an impressive advocate for the causes in which he believes, so I'm tempted to allow him maximum air time to carry on making his case. Right. Does Nigel Farage need more police protection, do you think, uh, Patrick O'Flynn, taxpayer-funded uh, uh, police protection? Uh, well, I think uh, party leaders uh, should be able to go out the bus about their business and make their mm. but that's uh, not the case, question. But that's not the question uh, I asked. Safety asked. and sec security. Well, you know, I don't think it's, it's up to me as a, a UKIP MEP uh, to, to make that judgment call, really. But clearly, Nigel is being subjected to uh, repeated intimidating incidents, and I think that demeans our democracy. And I would like to hear a little bit more from senior people in some of the other parties uh, in regard to this being wrong and intolerable. All right, gentlemen, thank you both very much. Well, Norman Baker, is it intolerable what happened? Well, it's intolerable if it's the case that Nigel Farage was deliberately targeted uh, and it was known that his family was there. He's entitled to a day off, as has been said, oh. by Mr Glass. Uh, if, however, that uh, there wasn't knowledge that his family was there um, and it was thought that he was just there and it was an accidental that they, they came across him, then it seems to me that was, that was fair enough. Uh, UKIP do stir up f strong feelings in either direction, it has to be said. I mean, they are... Uh, people who support UKIP feel very strongly for UKIP, but uh, they are the most disliked party uh, by those who express views against the party. Is it a legitimate form of public protest, Brandon Lewis, what you saw there? Well, I think, actually, I tend to agree with Norman. If what we are being told happened did happen and that he was tied with his family, I think it's completely unacceptable. I think we live in a democracy. People should have the right to have their say. But equally, and it's not just Nigel Farage's family, who do deserve to have a day off and we have to spend time together and have a lunch, as all of us would want to do in public life, but also everybody else who was in that pub as well was disrupted. So if that is what happened, I think it's completely unacceptable. There's plenty of opportunity for public comment, public um, uh, speeches to make a point but I think disrupting somebody's private life in that way is unacceptable if you're that's in what's the, happened. You're in the public eye, though, Fiona McTaggart. You can't you, you must expect a little bit of this. Absolutely. I was thinking while I was watching that of something that I did about 40 years ago as a student. 
I picketed Shirley Williams' own house. And what did she do? She invited us all in for a cup of tea. She was then the education minister. And I thought, mm. actually, in a way, that is one of the best ways to deal with disagreement, is to actually engage with the people that you disagree with. And I think maybe that would have been a better resolution to this, although I think it's wrong to get at people's children if that's what happened. But I do think that Shirley gave rather a good example of how to deal with people targeting their family, and I did it when I was too young to know better.